My name is Cynthia Cook, and I'm the president of the Town of Clinton Historical Society. And we're delighted to have you join us for this evening's program. It's, um, it's great, of course, that we continue to be able to have programs on Zoom because it allows people from all over to join us. And it also allows us to bring in speakers from, um, from far away sometimes, like last month uh, when we had Gregory. But we also, um, I'm not going to take up too much of your time, but I do want to say that as we are emerging from the pandemic, the Clinton Historical Society is going to be holding its annual meeting and potluck supper, and it'll be held on April 1st, which will be next month's essentially program. And, I, and it'll be in person. So it's a, you know, it's a red letter day to be able to come together there. I'm going to take people on little tours up into the, up into the second floor, into the archive. And I hope that we um, just have a, a lovely evening. And if you're members, I hope you'll join us. I'm sorry you can't be with us from California and Ohio, but um, maybe next time. <laughs> so without, I, well, I have to always thank Kathy McMahon, who is our IT maven, and she has um, does all the, well, not only the IT for this, but also the publicity and sends out the notices, and the notices and makes sure everything is is set up correctly. And then she, of course, works closely with Barbara Sweet, who is our program chair and reaches out to our speakers, finds our speakers, um, talks, talks them into joining us. And of course, um, is a great hostess for us. So I'm going to turn it over now to Barbara to introduce tonight's speaker. Barbara? Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, from here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> good to see you all. Uh, I just wanted to share with you um, what the update uh, to the calendar is for speakers. As Cynthia said, uh, we're having our annual meeting in person. Um, and the rest of the programs, I'm not sure whether they're gonna be in person or whatever. We never know what's down the road with the flu um, epidemic and pandemic. But in May, uh, we're planning on Fred Schaefer, who is um, a lawyer here in um, Dutchess County. But Fred is also uh, the first person to start in um, getting grants and everything for what we know here as the walkway over the Hudson. Okay, it's a large bridge, first one that was built um, for the railroad uh, back in the 1800s. It's still standing, and Fred will give us the history of it and how it became now the longest longest walkway in the world and also it's a state park so that's uh may and then in june we have um one of our members bob schaff uh who has a farm here which he's going to be redoing and uh then with him will be a person who is the uh, program chairman for the clinton uh, historical Clinton Library, I'm sorry, the Clinton Library. So Bob and Crystal Middleton will be talking about farming, early farming back in the 1700s, 1800s here in uh, the town of Clinton. And that will be also an exhibit that we have running uh, all the weekends, I believe the month of July. And then we'll start in again with programs again in September. But um, I'm not exactly sure how they're going to be. So you have to stick uh, and watch uh, our website to see what's going to happen. <clears throat> Did someone have a question? Okay. Um, tonight, uh, we're going about um, over to China a bit. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> extracting the truth from the trade. And this is about the Delano family at home and also out in China. Um, this presentation by historian, speaker, and writer Shannon Butler will explore the Delano family and their rise to fame and fortune as a result of their involvement 
in the opium trade in China. Uh, Shannon will offer her insights about the illegal business venture, including the Delano's experience during the opium wars and what they did with their wealth when they returned to the United States. Eventually, the fortune trickled down to Sarah Delano Roosevelt and her son, the 32nd president, Franklin D. Roosevelt. So let me introduce Shannon. She's a historian for the Poughkeepsie Public Library. That's in Dutchess County here. Um, and the historian of the town of Hyde Park. So she's got two type jobs. Okay, two history type jobs. She studied history at the um, State University of New York at New Paltz and also the State University in Albany. She's worked several historic sites here in the Hudson Valley, including the Roosevelt Vanderbilt uh, National Historic Site. That includes the Roosevelt Home, the Vanderbilt Home, and Valkill, which is Mrs. Roosevelt's home. Mrs. Roosevelt being the only first lady that has a national historic site. Okay. Um, she's also worked at Claremont Historic Site and the Dutchess County Historical Society. She's written two books, and um, they're both on local history. One titled The Roosevelt so, Home in the Hudson Valley, Hyde Park and Beyond, and then also a second book, Hyde Park in the Gilded Age. So I'll turn it over to Shannon to tell you more about the uh, Delano family tonight. So go ahead, Shannon. Well, thanks so much. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be here, uh, and I'm happy to give this uh, this talk. Um, this is actually a talk that I, I based off of um, a peer-reviewed uh, article that I published um, with Marist College in the Hudson River Valley Review. Um, this uh, this was actually my, my graduate studies um, uh, because I had always been fascinated with where the, the Delano family had made their wealth. Uh, so many people had said, well, it was, you know, the China trade. Well, what, what exactly does that mean? Um, and was it legal? And so those are big questions that I was, was, was asking as a young college student slash park ranger at the Roosevelt Estate. Um, so I decided to dig into it and I found all kinds of interesting stuff that I'm gonna share with you guys tonight. I'm gonna do a little screen share here. We're gonna bring up my PowerPoint. Let's see here. There we go. I hope everybody can see that. Yes, nod some heads. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I'm going to get rid of this video thing here so I don't have to see myself talking. Okay, there. There. Awesome. All right. Extracting the truth from the trade. So uh, first we're going to start with an image that I love to show. This is um, FDR has a young lad in his lovely little Scottish kilt there and his mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Uh, FDR was quoted for, as saying once, what vitality I have is not inherited from the Roosevelts. Mine, such as it is, comes from the Delanos. Um, and his mother uh, would once say that uh, FDR was a Delano first, and a Roosevelt second. Uh, so uh, she's very proud of her heritage, and so is Franklin for that matter. And this this side-by-side -side image I love to show because it shows Franklin and his mom in their older years, and they are like exact carbon copy. Um, Franklin looks just like his mom uh, from the, the, the chin, the nose, the, the gap in the teeth there, the smile, everything is just spot on. Their ears, I mean, it's, it's absolutely mind boggling how similar the, the two of these guys are. So there's, there's certainly a closeness there. And, and Franklin uh, was, was very proud of the Delano heritage that his mother passed down. Um, so we're gonna get into a little bit of that by first covering the early Delano ancestors. Um, now, first we're gonna start, start with the very first Delano to come to this country. Uh, he actually sailed on a ship called the Fortune in 1621, and his name was Philip Delano 
Uh, and he's actually a, uh, a Huguenot, and I'm sure a lot of you guys know about the Huguenots of, of uh, New Paltz, which is uh, where I did my undergrad work. Um, the Delano family uh, were escaping the religious prosecution that was going on. Of course, a lot of the uh, Huguenots would leave France and go to the Netherlands and then um, eventually make their way to um, the United States, or at the time, the, the colonies, um, Plymouth Colony, as the case is here. Uh, Philip was the first Delano to come over, and he established himself as a respected member of the Plymouth Colony uh, pretty early on. He took part in several campaigns. Uh, by campaigns, I mean campaigns against Native Americans, which is not necessarily a good thing, but to the colonists it was. Uh, um, so he was um, kind of going on these raids against local, local Native American tribes, and he also um, is famous for... Uh, uh, conducting the first land deal transaction. So he actually sold a parcel of land uh, pretty early on in the colony. So Philip gets the ball rolling. And then uh, the first real Delano to uh, establish the family uh, as, as a, a shipping and merchant sailing family is Ephraim Delano. And he was born in 1733 and he uh, will purchase a tiny little sloop called the Hana in 1758. Uh, he took bushels of wheat and corn and nails and hardware and things like that back and forth from New Bedford um, and the Boston area in general down to the Carolinas, uh, North Carolina specifically. So he's kind of going uh, along the, 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 the shoreline up and down the colonies um, in the mid 18th century. So he's he's the one that gets the family started in the the sailing uh, endeavors. This is a neat little uh, journal kept by Ephraim when he was on his ship. Um, this actually dates back to the 1760s and it talks about a little bit of everything, everything from what they're carrying, um, what they're seeing on the seas to what the weather's um, doing, um, how, how hard the wind's blowing, where it's blowing, that sort of thing. Um, so it's a, it's a neat little book. I, I always thought that the, the drawing, the little self-portrait there on the cover was, was fascinating. Um, the FDR Presidential Library Museum, which of course is run by the National Archives and Records Administration here in High Park, uh, has a ton of really great resources um, for Delano family uh, research, but they're not alone. Uh, I was able to also find a lot of stuff at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, um, which is um, right across the river from Fairhaven, where the Delanos had kind of established themselves in a, in a home, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So here we go, the Delanos in the New Republic. This is a photograph of the port at New Bedford, Massachusetts. And right across the river there is Fairhaven. Um, this, uh, of course, was a major port in the uh, Massachusetts area. And the Delanos would set sail from here all the time. And anytime they were making their way out into the world, this is where uh, you'd see a lot of action. And of course, um, New Bedford's famous for their, their whaling museum today. If you've never been, I highly recommend. It's fascinating. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of really great uh, sailing um, memorabilia in there and some, some really great Delano pieces as well. I was able to find some really neat stuff there. So the captain. This is Captain Warren Delano I. Now he's nicknamed the captain because he's the first of the Delano family uh, to take their shipping ventures overseas. Um, he took he took on uh, sailing at the age of 19. Uh, you know, it's pretty common to get into sailing pretty early on. 19 might even be a little late. Uh, a lot of guys joined up and started sailing even earlier than that. But uh, it wouldn't take him long to become a captain. He was a captain by the age of 23. Now, um, the War of 1812 um, was a kind of a troubling time for him. Now, he, he heads over, um, starts sailing back and forth uh, to England with, with goods, but um, he's, he actually ends up being captured a couple times, um, which um, I, I, I don't know, do I... I guess I might not talk about that in this program, but here, I'll, I'll talk about it anyway. Um, so Warren... 
uh, has a full ship full of men, supplies, and products, and he's captured by a, a British frigate, and uh, they take his ship and his crew a prize, and he ends up spending some time on a, on a prison ship for a bit, and then he pulls himself together and gets back out there and gets another ship and crew together. Now, this is incredibly expensive to put together uh, a ship and a crew, and this is, this is not a cheap venture. And he heads back out onto the seas with another ship and another crew, and he's captured again. Uh, loses another ship and another crew. So after that, he um, decides, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to the land uh, from here on out, which uh, we don't, we don't blame him. Now, here is his son, Warren Delano Jr. Actually, he has many sons, but this is his eldest. Warren was born in 1809 in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. By 15 years old, he's an apprentice at Hathaway and Company in Boston, and he's uh, he's actually by 18 he's looking out for his father's whaling business. Now, by the time Warren's 18, his father is doing most of his shipping and whaling and so forth from land. Uh, he's not getting on the ship anymore. He's he's sending ships and men out, and, and they're doing the, the the stuff, and he's he's bringing in the money. He's the owner, of course, but he's not heading out. So um, I think he might have gotten a little spooked from being captured during the War of 1812 <laughs> a couple times. So um, he's not inspiring his sons to get out on a ship and get out to sea quite yet. He's like, yeah, stay, stay on land, learn the business trade, and then if you feel like it, maybe get out there. Um, so he uh, worked with his younger brother, Frederick, uh, Frederick Delano. They worked in Boston. Uh, like I said, learning banking and shipping from uh, from land. Uh, and then he would head off to New York City where he worked for Good Hue and Company. Uh, and at this point, we're in 1833 and he's he's still he's he's young and he's he's ready to head out there and and see the world. But he's like 22, 23 years old here. And uh, he decides he's going to head out to China because from what he understands from his banking and business partners in New York City uh, and Boston, uh, China's where it's at. So he heads on out. And this is what he sees when he heads into China. This is Canton, uh, specifically the area known as the 13 factories. Um, when he arrived in China, the American tea and opium business in 1833 was twice what it had been previously. Uh, America began its humble beginnings in the opium trade. Um, the, the opium had been coming into the country since the 18th century. Um, and I, I want to stress that this is illegal. We'll, we'll get into that. But um, America was picking up its opium in Turkey. <coughs> Excuse me, because India was under British control, so Americans can't just go into uh, India and pick up uh, opium. They they just can't because that's British controlled territory. So they go to Turkey instead and get their opium there. Now. Um, this image, as I said, is the 13 factories district, which was where the foreign traders were allowed to be and were allowed to live. They couldn't exit this area. The 13 factories was a, a tiny, tiny area to live in, actually. Um, it was cramped, very uncomfortable. It was about 300 feet back from the Pearl River. Now, each factory was long and narrow, and uh, it was... Um, each factory was for a specific country. Like you had France, you had Great Britain, you had the United States, you had the Netherlands, you know, you had all these places um, working in these factories. Uh, and foreigners, like I said, were not really allowed to go much beyond the 13 factories area. Here's another image of the 13 factories. Now, the people who were working in these factories were, were Chinese. Uh, all the servants, the people who were making the, the food for the, uh, the, tra the foreign traders, the people who were for cleaning the households of the foreign traders were all uh, Chinese, as you can see here from this, this drawing. Um, 
the uh, the Chinese uh, servants were all provided for by Chinese merchants known as Hongs. And the Hongs who were dealing with these traders would, would do whatever they could to make the traders comfortable, to make them stay and do business, which includes providing them with these servants. So for many uh, Americans uh, published their thoughts on the Chinese way of, of life, uh, which they didn't fully understand. They didn't, they didn't quite understand the, the world of the, the Chinese. Um, so a lot of the early um, publishings of, 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 of words of Americans coming from China were not that, were not that great. Um, and and that, on the other hand, the Chinese believed that the foreign traders were devils. They were they, uh, they didn't like them that much either. So with the exception of the, the Hongs who were making money off the foreign traders. Um, it was a really weird wor world to live in, but um, this, is, this is what Warren jumped into head first. Um, here we see that the, the reason that the Chinese considered these foreign, foreign traders uh, devils was because of what they were bringing into the country. The foreign devils brought with them cheap and extremely addictive opium, uh, which was affecting every part of society, from the incredibly rich to the incredibly poor, everybody was hooked. You see, there, China saw itself as a self-sustainable nation. It saw itself as, we don't need anything from any of these foreigners. We have everything we need right here. What could you possibly have to offer us? Uh, because these foreigners are coming in for tea. That's the, uh, the addiction that the uh, Americans and the British had, right, is Chinese tea. Um, they're also coming in for Chinese uh, porcelain, uh, for artwork, for furnishings. All that stuff is, is being bought up by, by the British and the Americans. Um, but what, what do you got to trade? Uh, opium was something that everybody wanted. Uh, and it's something that the Chinese government was trying to fight off. So this is uh, a photograph of, uh, of a Chinese opium den. Now here we see a Chinese tea tasting room. So Warren, this is where he's spending most of his days, um, sitting here uh, tasting and weighing teas uh, and placing the orders and, and weighing the cargo for shipment. Um, so he's spending a lot of time uh, working in, in spaces like this. Now, Warren was made partner of a, a small company, a very small American trading firm called Russell Sturges and Company. And uh, he was made partner in 1834. And he, he actually wrote home um, to uh, his family. He said, my present position is one quite satisfactory to me. And if business flows into our hands like we hope, I shall make a sensible fortune in the course of a few years. So he's planning on making a fortune in just a couple of years. So business is good. Now, meanwhile, back home in the States, this is uh, New York City in the 1830s. Warren, uh, he was fully into his work and his place in life was being secured. And he wrote home to his brother, Franklin. Uh, and he was trying uh, to uh, get Franklin to maybe come overseas with him. Franklin was doing business in New York City. He was doing okay, um, taking a lot of the, the teas that were being brought back and, and selling them. Um, he suggested that perhaps uh, Franklin can get on a ship and come to China and help him out. Um, but uh, Franklin uh, decided, no, nah, I'm gonna stay here in the States. Now, Robert Forbes. Now you might have heard the name Forbes before. Um, very, very big name associated with wealth. Uh, he asks Warren to join a much larger firm uh, of Russell and Company. And this is in 1839. This firm was actually one of the few firms that did have access to the more valuable Indian opium um, because there were, they had some British connections. This is a very powerful image. This is a, a scene from a, a factory in India uh, producing the, uh, the balls of opium that are going to be placed in these, these massive wooden chests and, and shipped uh, to China. And um, this just kind of gives you an idea, the sense of, of how much of this stuff is really going around. This is just one factory in India.
So with more and more merchants from other countries bringing in this, this toxic drug, uh, China decided it's, it's got to finally put its foot down. It's got to take some action here and, and stop it. Warren wrote home to his brother Franklin saying, appearances indicate a determination on the part of the government to crush the trade entirely. Uh, so this is this is very concerning to folks like Warren and, and everybody else that's a foreigner living in the 13 factories district. Now the guy responsible for really uh, taking a, um, a, or I should say causing a major blow uh, in the opium business is this guy right here. Um, this is um, Lin Zuzo, and he's a commissioner uh, sent by the, the, the government in China to put a stop to things. Now, I, like I said, I, I want it to be understood. I, I can't tell you how many times as a park ranger when I was telling people about the opium business when how many Americans would go, well, it was, it was a legal trade. It was illegal. No, it was not a legal trade. The Chinese were trying to fight it. Um, so it was not, it was, the Delanos were glorified drug dealers is what we're saying here. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the Chinese government uh, starts uh, sensing Commissioner Lin Zenzu and he finally cracked down hard, uh, uh, hard enough to demand the surrender of all opium chests in 1839. Now he removed all the Chinese servants from the factories, right? He, he heads him, he takes out all the servants to try to make things um, a little less comfortable for the, the foreigners. Um, Warren actually was writing home uh, saying that he actually had to serve as his company's cook for a while because their cook was removed. And he's like, I don't know, I'm just I'm making rice. I don't know what I'm doing, you know. Uh, <laughs> and the commissioner Lin then threatened to kill, um, not the foreigners, but the, uh, the Chinese Hongs. Uh, Hagua, who was a, a big one, probably one of the richest men in China, Hagua, who was, was actually friends with Warren Delano and, and traders like him, um, he actually threatened to kill Hagua and any other Chinese Hongs um, that were, were, were going along with this opium business. Uh, so Warren Delano's firm and all the other firms ended up surrendering their opium on June 3rd, uh, 1839. And here we have a, a Chinese image of Hagua hanging out there overseeing the destruction uh, of the, uh, the opium. So that they're, uh, they're burying it there in mud. So it, it's um, mud and sand so that it's damaged and, and, and can't be smoked properly. So the British uh, did not like this one bit. They took this loss personally. So what they decided to do was close down all of their factories in China and get on their ships and go home and just stop all trade. Um, they thought that was going to make China change their mind. Um, that didn't work. And companies like Russell and Company uh, decided to stay and they were happy to take up whatever business the British had left behind on their retreat out of China. So Warren would, would still stay busy, but um, instead of doing the opium like they were doing before, uh, they were bringing in American, uh, Southern American cotton, of course. The, the South was famous for its cotton here in the United States. Another kind of uh, unfortunate connection with, with slave trade, right? Um, so the, um, the cotton is coming over. And the, uh, the Chinese, particularly the northern Chinese, where it's a little bit colder, loved the American cotton and they were, they were buying that stuff up. So the, the Delanos were still doing well, not necessarily in opium anymore, but uh, cotton instead. But then the British decided they weren't going to stay out of this for long. They came back with a vengeance and they came back for war in 1840. Uh, that's when the first opium war broke out. Uh, Warren experienced violence uh, firsthand in the Canton area. Uh, when the British decided to come back with their huge navy, of course, the British had one of the largest navies in the world at the time. So uh, you can see here in this, this uh, painting that uh, Chinese ships and, and junks aren't really much of a match uh, to British warships. Here we have a map 
uh, the Canton River area. Um, you can actually, it's, it's kind of hard to see on here, but there's little dots in the river, Brown's Passage, um, um, Blenheim Reach, and uh, Fiddler's Reach, and so forth. You can see where there's all these ships located, and those are all British ships hanging out, sort of barricading the area. And if you look up to the left-hand side, you can see Canton. Uh, you can see the um, old city, the new city, and the, the little areas up front uh, where the factories were. And like I said, really, really tiny spaces where these factories were located, where the foreigners were allowed. So Warren, he's, he's dealing with the, uh, the mayhem of war up close and personal. And he asks his little youngest brother, Edward, to come to China in 1840. Like I said, Franklin, his other brother, had already found business. Um, so Edward decided he's, he's young, he wants to see the world, he wants the adventure that Warren's had, so he heads on a boat and he, and he sails on over. Um, and as soon as he gets, there, gets to China, he arrives in time to see a war going on. And it's a, it's a harsh awakening for him. His diaries, um, which are all uh, in the Presidential Library Museum at uh, High Park. Uh, they're very revealing uh, on how things were going, how the British treated the Chinese, um, the, the various skirmishes that were going on. Uh, he writes about all this stuff um, in his diaries, and, and it's quite neat. Now, just so you know here, we have his, his signature that you're seeing there, and the Chinese lettering around it. Um, he did not write those Chinese letters. Um, somebody else did, probably one of the servants uh, in the factory did it for him uh, because uh, um, Chinese uh, were not allowed to teach foreigners Mandarin. Um, so he probably just had a guy write that down for him real quick so he can see what it looked like. This is um, Edward's diary from Canton. And um, it's kind of neat because, like I said, it, it kind of talks about everything. He writes so beautifully, too. His handwriting is really nice and, and easy to read. Um, unlike Eleanor Roosevelt's handwriting. I know I know some of you guys are, are fellow Roosevelt geeks, and if you've ever read Eleanor Roosevelt's handwriting, oh, God, <laughs> it's, it's rough. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but her, her um, or I should say FDR's, uh, uh, let's see, this would be his granduncle, um, had beautiful handwriting and it's and it's really quite nice. Um, so he writes about the war, he writes about nights spent in the factories, uh, drinking, and smoking some tobacco and, and enjoying the scenery and and um, it's uh, it's kind of kind of interesting. He's also kind of bored at times, you can tell. Uh, Warren was concerned about the way the the uh, British were treating the Chinese, as was Ed um, or Ned. Edward Delano, also known as Ned. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, he was actually captured, uh, Warren Delano was captured uh, by the commissioner who was fighting against the opium dealers. Um, they captured him, they took him to a prison and he, he actually wrote home about it. Um, then they realized that he wasn't British, he was an American. And they're like, oh, oh, okay, we're, we're sorry. We're totally sorry. So they, they put him up on a chair and Put them up, put him up on their shoulders, and they, they carried him back to his factory. And when Ned saw him coming down the street on top of this chair, on top of this crowd, he's like, "What? What in the world?" You know, it must have been quite the sight. But uh, Warren was like, "I was kind of afraid for my life there for a second, but uh, we're we're okay." <laughs> so it was a, a strenuous time. Here's an image of a a battle going on, um, and of course the British, with all of their fire and might, they won in August of 1842. The British Navy and Army overpowered the Chinese, and they won not just a major victory, but they also uh, they ha also won more access to China itself. Um, they gained sovereignty over Hong Kong, uh, of course, which is which is a major major area, and um, that opened up more trading opportunities uh, with China, which is ex exactly what they didn't want. It's exactly what the Chinese were trying to prevent. So uh, Warren had been in China now for uh, almost 10 years. He'd been there about nine years. And he wanted to go home and he wanted to start a family and kind of take advantage of some of the wealth that he had acquired. 
And so he decided he was going to make sure everything had kind of calmed down in China. It took him a long time to finally say, all right, I'm going to go. There's, there's, you see all these, these letters. He's like, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to stick around for a little bit longer. Uh, okay. No, I'm going back home. Uh, no, I'm going to stay. Uh, no, oh, I'm going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to go. So <laughs> it's like, he can't make up his mind there for a while. I think he's really nervous about leaving the business to his little brother, Ned, and, and going back. But eventually his brother's like, nah, go, I, I got this. Go, go over, get yourself married. I'll see you soon. So not only does Ned take over things and, and runs things quite well, but Ned gets the, the family back into the opium business. Um, he actually, um, along with another member of their, uh, their firm, Russell and Company, he decided to, to head on over to India himself. And, and see the opium making process and, and check it all out for himself. And, and it's kind of interesting because he goes to India and he explores this, this bazaar, this market, right? And he decided he wanted to walk into an opium den and see it up close for himself. So, and he writes, he writes about it too. Um, let's see, I think we got, oops, yeah, here we go. So he walks into an opium den in India, and he finds uh, the smokers all hanging around doing their thing. And he wrote in his, his diary, he said, one man was prostrate under its effects, pale, cadaverous, and death-like in appearance. He said, I took my, I took the pipe from his hand and he offered no resistance, but he watched with his eyes as I moved the pipe from side to side. It's very weird. But what's really weird about him writing all this down is that the guy knows the stuff he's trading is, is horrible. He can, he, he can see firsthand what it's doing to people. And he's just like, okay, well, gotta make money. And he grabs his shipment of opium and heads back to China. So, kind of not a pleasant thought. Meanwhile, back in the States, Warren finds himself a lovely lady. He um, will marry Catherine Lyman. Uh, Catherine is, uh, of course, as you can see, quite lovely. Uh, she is uh, a daughter of a, of a, a well-known judge in the Boston area, and they get married, um, and they don't really have much of a honeymoon. They kind of quickly head back to China. It was real fast. Um, so he, he brings his wife to China. By this point, they are living on the uh, island of Macau. Uh, another interesting thing about China is um, the, uh, the women foreigners, fe female foreigners, were not allowed in the 13 factories area. They, they weren't really even allowed in uh, mainland China. They, they stayed in Macau. Uh, which was a little island which uh, uh, belonged to the Portuguese. So, uh, so she uh, she lived there in a in a mansion that they called Arrowdale, uh, which really belonged to the firm Russell and Company, and the Delanos kind of made it their home. And uh, while they were in China, they had a daughter, um, Susan, and then they had another daughter, uh, Louise, uh, 1844 and 1846. But in 1846. Susan died. Uh, and Catherine was incredibly worried uh, that Louise was going to die too, because her health was also not that great. So Warren takes a look at the situation. Uh, he looks at the fact that he's, he's lost a daughter, his other daughter's sick, his wife is nervous. They've got their money. They've, they've got plenty of wealth. So he says to his brother Ned, he says, well, I think it's time that we pack it up, go home, end our trade in China. So that's what they do. And it kind of worked out because they, they came on back and they established themselves in this uh, fine palace right here. Uh, this is actually um, in New York City. There's a tiny portion of it still still today in the, um, what's that, the Lafayette District, I believe. Um, this is uh, known as uh, Colonnade Row is the, uh, the, the title for this, this building. And so the uh, Delanos moved into a, an apartment in this, or I should say a townhouse, 
uh, in this row. And they had neighbors like the Vanderbilts and the Astors and uh, Washington Irving also lived um, in this row. And it was, a, it was a beautiful place to call home. They had a, um, a couple, uh, they had like three floors, um, lots of space, servants. Um, Warren is, is just uh, making a, a nice life for himself and his family in New York City. Now, New York City's great, you know, everybody loves New York City, but a lot of the people in New York City also want to live in the Hudson River Valley um, because that's where all the rich people go, out of the city and up the river. So Warren decides it's time to find a place upstream. Now, he was asking his uh, other brother, Franklin, where he should go because Franklin already had <clears throat> excuse me, a nice house on the river, <coughs> excuse me, uh, up in uh, just north of Rhinebeck, a place called Stin Vilecci. Now, uh, w Franklin had also married an Astor, so that's why he's got a nice piece of land and a nice house in that neck of the woods. So he's, uh, Warren says to Franklin, uh, could, you, could you help me find a suitable house on the river? So he looked around a bit and um, they started renting a place outside of Newburgh. And then they finally found a, a house uh, for sale uh, just north of Newburgh. This house to be exact, which they would call Algonac. Now Warren had rented uh, in 1847, the little, little uh, another house just north of here. And then he buys this, this particular house in, in land in 1851. He called it Petite Place because it wasn't a lot of land. It was about 50 acres, um, which to me is a lot of land, but to them, not so much. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, he hires um, architects, a landscape architect and a, an actual architect. He, he hired Andrew Jackson Downing and Calvert Vaugh to come in and uh, improve the uh, the landscape and the, the homestead, make it a little bit better. Uh, they started planting all these trees, pear trees, apple trees, and so forth. So they had a nice orchard, they had um, a gatehouse, and, and it really did become this really beautiful, comfortable place to live. And uh, from what I understand, it's now for sale. Uh, at least the, the rebuilt version of it is for sale. Uh, I forgot what it was. It was something ridiculous, like seven million dollars or something like that. I don't know. Uh, way out of my price range, anyway. But uh, very quickly, Warren began filling the house with his Chinese artifacts that he brought home. Um, in that photograph down below there, you could see a, a massive Chinese vase, some Chinese stands there in a very, very typical teak wood fashion there. Uh, he also brought home a, a huge portrait of uh, Magua, the uh, Chinese Hong that he had made his fortune with. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the, the place was was quite um, inspired by, by Chinese art and architecture and furnishings. Now, Catherine and Warren had the rest of their children here at Algonac, of course, including Sarah. Uh, they had 11 children altogether. Uh, they wrote down every detail of their life at Algonac in uh, these diaries. Um, the, which are now known as the Algonac Diaries. And they wrote the good times, the bad times, it's, they're, it's all in there. And the Algonac Diaries are now at the FDR Presidential Library Museum. Now, uh, Warren, he starts taking his wealth that he had made in China and he starts investing uh, a little bit of everything here. He starts investing in copper mines in Tennessee, iron mines in Maryland, uh, of course, railroads uh, and so forth. But he managed to stretch himself um, a little bit thin. Um, the panic of 1857, 1858 uh, would hit him pretty hard. And he, Warren decided that he needed to rebuild his, his chest, as they say. So he decided to go back to the business that he knew best, China. So he set sail and by 1860, he's back. Uh, here we have an image in the, uh, right, right about the 1860s um, of Macau in China. And so Warren goes back 
he's he's still a, a partner with the Russell and Company um, firm, the big American firm that he was uh, he was in when he last was there. He's dealing in silks and opium again, uh, and bringing tea and things back. Um, but the the start of uh, the American Civil War would kind of slow things up a little bit for him because he, he was also bringing the cotton and so forth. So he's he's not getting the cotton anymore with the Civil War going on. So he's uh, he's kind of limited to just the opium, and he, it's taking him a little bit longer to rebuild his fortune that than he assumed it would. So um, he gets lonely. And, and it's really funny because Warren is lonely like all the time when he's alone in China, even from his, his young age when he's a young man. And now that he's got a family back home in the States, you can see it in his letters home, he's, he's feeling depressed. So he writes his wife, Kate, and he says, pack up the family, come on over to China. So his wife packs up the family and moses on over there oh uh, which i have to say is is quite impressive given the fact that there's a war going on and confederate raider ships out there and so forth um so june 25th 1862 they hop on a clipper ship called the surprise with a, a captain uh named captain renlet he's 28 years old and um the delano family are pretty much the main passengers so you got catherine you got her seven children. Uh, so that's Louise, Dora, Annie, Warren, Sally, or Sarah Delano, as we know, uh, Philip, and Cassie. And they also have uh, Catherine's cousin, Nancy Church, and two nurses to help wrangle the children. Um, the nurse, the nurses were named Davis and Ellen. We don't, we don't know it, any other names but those. So, <clears throat> 126 day journey from New York City to China. And this, uh, this book that you see here is actually the family journal kept during that time period. So this, this, this book um, made its way on a ship from New York City to China, the family jotting down their thoughts along the way, and, and it managed to make its way back. Um, to this this area which is is pretty cool when you think about how far this thing has gone um so they they are you know there's there's moments where they're a little bit nervous so there's moments where they just have seasick sickness and boredom i think um they had a birthday party on the ship during the time for the captain and uh sarah i think they were both having a birthday around the same time period so there's all kinds of random things going on mostly they're just bored out of their minds because that's a long long trip on open seas with all these little kids. <laughs> That's gotta be rough. So anyway, they get they finally get to China on Halloween. Uh, and they arrive at a beautiful mansion um, that the Russell and Company had built called Rose Hill. And life was pretty great. Um, they brought with them uh, a pony and uh, and they had all of their toys and they had tutors and they were they, they lived in these beautiful house with these beautiful gardens and, you know, things were pretty good. Uh, they, uh, they enjoyed China for the most part, the kids. There's Warren with two of his daughters. Um, and while they were there, two more Delano kids would be born, Fred and Laura. Uh, and that, that would be the end of the, the Roosevelt kids. So I, 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 I think I, I said earlier that all the other kids were, were born in Algonac. That's that's not true. Two kids um, were born um, uh, in China, Fred and Laura. Um, and, you know, they had they had tea parties and all kinds of good stuff there. And, and they were also learning about the war uh, going on in the United States. And, uh, you know, they were a little worried about family back home during this time, too. And you occasionally see Warren writing about Abraham Lincoln and, and the war effort and so forth. They certainly kept up with gossip and everything. This is a cool document. So this is um, in the Presidential Library Museum, once again. And it's actually um, a ledger that Warren Delano kept. And it must have been in his office or something. And I can, I can just picture uh, his little boy, Warren III, who's just a little kid, right? 
And Warren the third, I can picture him going into his daddy's office and saying, you know, dad, I want some paper. I want to, I want to draw. I'm, I'm bored. I need something to color with. And, and Warren just handing him one of those used ledgers and saying, here, here, take, take that. Go, go color. So <laughs> Warren took one of his father's work ledgers and he glued images from like Harper's Magazine and um, London Illustrated and uh, he glued them into the, the book and he just colored into them, uh, which is really cool. But at the same time, you can, you can look through the images and you can see where uh, you have opium, opium shipments uh, and where they're going and, and how much. And, and you can just kind of see right there in black and white, it says, it says opium, various kinds of opium that were being, being traded. So it's uh, talking about reading between the lines here um on on their on their ventures it's quite neat actually so they uh after they had made another fortune warren and kate had uh, decided it was time to at least send the youngest children back to the states so um the war had had come to an end the civil war that is uh here in the states and they said, well, what, one, we'll, we'll send the younger kids back home to, to America where they can be uh, safer than, than China. And since the family's home in Newburgh, Algonac, was being rented uh, while they were in China, they sent them home to uh, Grandpa Warren, or AKA the captain, uh, in Fairhaven. And what you see here is the, uh, the Fairhaven home of the Delano family. Uh, which, by the way, is a bed and breakfast. And um, I got to stay there. I stayed in the, the quote, Sarah Delano Roosevelt room uh, when I was doing research at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. It's, uh, it's quite a nice house, actually. Very, very old school. Um, so anyway, the, the kids went to, uh, to Fairhaven. Some of the younger kids went to Fairhaven to be with Grandpa. And the whole family would actually end up coming back when Captain Warren took ill in 1866. So uh, Warren and Catherine, they packed up the whole, whoever was left and uh, except a couple of uh, daughters stay behind. Dora and Annie stayed in China because they had married two of the partners from Russell and Company. So, uh, so anyway, the, the rest of the family comes back home to Fairhaven and they got there just in time uh, for Warren, the captain, Warren's father, uh, to die uh, in their home in Fairhaven. So at this point, uh, Warren, our opium trader, decides to expand the family home in Fairhaven, makes it a little bit bigger for his, his new and enlarged family. So here we have the Delano sisters, a very lovely bunch. Um, now, of course, the family would continue to grow even more when Sarah, Sarah married uh, the much older widower, James Roosevelt, in 1880. Um, from this marriage, of course, we get the 32nd president, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And here we have a Delano family reunion. Warren is sitting at the center with his wife, Catherine and seven children, plus eight grandkids. Franklin is here right next to his grandpa. Ned, um, Warren's brother, had died a few years before this image was taken, so Ned's not here. Uh, the family had plenty of money, of course. Uh, this photograph was taken, um, I believe at Algonac, um, the, uh, the home in Newburgh. The, um, I, I should say that you notice there's a uh, framed photograph all the way to the right there in the image. That is uh, Laura Delano, the youngest of the Delano sisters, Sarah's youngest sister. She had died a few years before this photograph was taken. Um, in a, she had uh, burned to death, sadly, at the, at the Delano home in Newburgh, Algonac. Um, she was uh, curling her hair with an old-fashioned curly on iron, and she knocked over the alcohol lamp beside her, and she went up in flames, sadly. Uh, they, they say that's where Franklin's dreadful fear of fire had started, uh, was the uh, sort of witnessing the death of his aunt. 
how much he saw, we don't really know. He was just a baby. Um, but he certainly heard the screams of his beloved aunt uh, running through the house on fire. So anyway, the Delanos uh, would contribute uh, quite heavily to the community around them in Newburgh, specifically um, various organizations and also uh, Fairhaven for that matter. Um, in 1885, they built a hospital in New York City, actually, which they had named in honor of Laura Delano, the, the young sister who died. Um, Annie, one of the daughters, uh, donated land to the city of Newburgh, which became Delano Hitch Park today, right? Um, Sarah, of course, gave a, a whole bunch of money to the town of High Park in various ways. Um, of course, she built the James Roosevelt Memorial Library in the 1920s here in High Park, uh, which have, now is the, the High Park Free Library. But she, she built it in honor of James. Uh, of course, she uh, donated uh, quite a bit of money to St. James Church, uh, the Episcopal Church here in High Park, where the Roosevelts uh, attended. And um, and she also served on various charity boards and, um, and organizations throughout the course of her life. So, so always sort of giving money to various causes. And, and in the, of course, her, her wealth would help uh, FDR in his campaigns over the years. FDR was not a wealthy man. He, he certainly um, benefited from the wealth of his, his mother and her family. And um, later on, a, a journalist who um, was not a big fan of FDRs um, had, had claimed, you know, he or had stated, the only reason that Franklin can run for third and fourth terms is because of his family's opium money, uh, which is true. <laughs> and then, of course, you see FDR kind of reaching out to China um, in World War II when he befriends um, Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, he was particularly close with Madame Che Kai-shek, Su Mei Ling, right? Uh, and she stayed in the house uh, on several occasions. So it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting, um, the, the, the Roosevelt Delano Chinese connection uh, would continue on even into FDR's later years. Here we have a photograph of Warren um, pretty much at the end of his life. Um, he, uh, he's sitting in the Delano home in Newburgh wearing a beautiful Chinese robe, as you can see. And um, at the end of his life, um, Robert Forbes wrote to him, his, his partner back in, the, in China. And he asked him if he wanted to contribute details to a book about the firm. He, he said to Warren, would you like to help me? I'm writing a history of our beloved firm in, in China. Would you like to contribute your thoughts and add historical details to it? And Warren said, no, pass. And so did just about all the other members of the firm. Nobody wanted to throw their thoughts into this business. Um, even though Warren had wrote home as a young man saying, quote, this trade is a fair, honorable and legitimate trade. And that it is no different than bringing spirits and link liquors into the US. So he's, he's trying to say it's it's trading one addiction for the other, but uh, it's not, not quite. Although it is interesting to note that the United States now has a huge opium crisis. China does not. So the, the tides have turned, if you will. So that concludes my discussion of the Delanos and the opium trade.